Hello everyone, I'm Kathleen Pelly. Welcome to the special omnibus edition of Journey with Story, where you can listen to all of this month's episodes one after the other. And just so you know, there will be no special intro for the individual stories, no added details and no shout outs. If you want to hear all of those, then you'll need to listen to the individual episodes and not this version. Got it? Oh, mums, dads, grown-ups, you can download some free colouring sheets at our website, www.journeywithstory.com. Let's take an omnibus journey with story. Now, let's take a journey with Pandora's Box. In ancient times, before human beings walked the earth, the gods, titans and other immortals made earth their home. One day, Zeus, the king of all the gods, ordered two titans, Prometheus and his brother Epimetheus, to create the animals and the first men. The two brothers went to the riverbank and set about forming the first animals and humans from clay. Epimetheus gave the animals many gifts, such as swiftness of foot, piercing vision and unbounded strength. But then, too late, he realised he now did not have enough gifts to bestow on the humans. Prometheus, feeling sorry for the poor mortals, stole fire from Mount Olympus and carried it down to them. But Zeus was furious. How dare these mortals take fire that belonged to the gods? He would have his revenge. How? Listen now to the story of Pandora's Box. Zeus asked the other gods to help him make a very special woman. Not only was she bright and beautiful, but she was also clever and charming and musical. Then Zeus sent for Epimetheus. Here is a wife for you, he said. She is your reward for making all the animals of the earth. Then Zeus gave the couple a special box, bound and locked. Keep this safe, he commanded them. And I warn you at all costs, you must never, ever, Ever open this box. You are to keep it locked at all times. The young couple agreed to do as Zeus had commanded, and then Epimetheus set off at once to marry the beautiful Pandora. So enchanted was he with her beauty and charm that he forgot to heed his brother's warning. Never accept gifts from the other gods. After the wedding, Prometheus stowed the box in a dark corner of their house. Pandora was delighted with their splendid home. She loved the gardens that brimmed with sweet scented flowers and splashing fountains. But no matter what she was doing, drinking water from the well or closing the upstairs shutters to her room, stirring coals in the hearth or gathering olives in the gardens, she could not stop thinking about the special box that Zeus had given them. Day and night, night and day, the thought of that box niggled her. What was in the box, she wondered. Pandora's husband seemed to know what his wife was wondering. Remember, that box is not to be opened, he reminded her. Never, never, never. 
The gods have commanded it. We must not disobey them. Meekly, Pandora nodded. Of course, my husband, you are right, she agreed. Still, secretly, when her husband was not looking, Pandora would wonder about the box. What could be in it? she asked herself, over and over again. Jewels? Or some other precious object? One day, when her husband was off in the fields, Pandora happened to catch sight of the box, sitting in a dark corner in a room just off the courtyard. It seemed to call out to her. Pandora tiptoed into the room. The box seemed to give off an odd golden glow. Closer and closer, Pandora tiptoed. Suddenly she felt a cold shiver tingle down her spine. Her husband's words rang in her head. Remember that box has not to be opened. Never, never, never. The gods have commanded it. We, we must, must not, not we disobey must them. Not, we must not, we she edged back, back, back. Then she turned and ran trembling to her room. Days passed. Weeks passed. Months passed. But Pandora's wondering about the box did not lessen, not one little bit. Instead, it grew and grew like a storm cloud, swirling and twirling around her until it almost engulfed her. Try as she might, she could not stop thinking or wondering about that box. She tried to distract herself with other simpler thoughts. She sat in the courtyard and admired the brightly coloured blossoms. She listened to the birds singing from the rooftops. And she tossed pebbles into the fountains as she sang all the ancient songs etched on her heart. She even fetched a brush knelt in the courtyard and painted pictures from the old stories onto the white tiles. But the old stories and songs and pictures all led her mind back to the mysterious locked box. One day, while Pandora was out strolling in the nearby high hills, she came upon, crouched on the rock ledge above her, a graceful mountain lioness staring down at her. For a moment, the woman and the animal stared into each other's eyes. Then, slowly, the lioness turned and in one nimble leap disappeared. Pandora puzzled at what such an encounter could mean, but she could not make any sense of it, and yet, on the way home, she felt a sudden surge of courage. It filled her heart. It banished all her fear. The following morning, Pandora found herself all alone in the house. She walked outside to the courtyard and passed the room where the box stood hidden in the corner. The door to the room was ajar. Once more she noticed the box seemed to emit a strange golden glow. Pandora walked right past the room. But then she turned back and began to pace back and forth, back and forth. Again she seemed to hear the box speak to her. Suddenly, Pandora 
stepped inside the room. She shut the door behind her. Maybe, maybe it would be all right if she had just lifted the lid a, a tiny, teeny little bit and took a very quick peek inside, she told herself. Slowly, Pandora tiptoed forward. One step, two steps, three steps. She felt her heart quiver. Her fingers shook as she fumbled with the lid. Ever so gently, she pried it open and peered inside. Stillness surrounded her. And then, then... Pandora stumbled backward as if a giant wave had washed over her. She felt herself flung backwards against a wall. Dazed and trembling, she saw horrible winged creatures flap from the box. Gnarly, twisty things spun past her head. Screaming voices drenched the air. Howls and whistles, screeches and wails rang in her ears. Mustering her courage and strength, Pandora crawled toward the box. A flurry of claws and feathers beat against her hair. She reached up with one arm and just before she could snap the lid back in place, a tiny butterfly fluttered out on yellow wings like a splash of sunlight. I am hope. It sang out. Pandora gasped. Something good remains, she thought. All is not lost. Staggering outside, she met her husband running up to gather her in his arms. The box, she gasped. There were bad things. They have escaped. It was my fault, my fault. Now the air was filled with a black cloud. A terrible storm was brewing. Trouble. I know, I know, answered Epimetheus, grasping Pandora's hand. Harm and evil have entered the world now, but we must be brave, very brave. Pandora nodded. Yes, she could do that. She could be brave. She would use all the gifts and powers the gods had given her. She felt her fear ebb away. She felt a bubble in her heart. A spark of light lifting her spirits. What is it? She wondered. And then she looked up and saw the butterfly fluttering above her. This was hope that she felt. From that day to this, even although we humans have to bear sadness and loss and suffering, we have hope to help lighten our hearts and ease our pain. Let's take a journey with Four Clever Brothers. Dear children, 
said a poor man to his four sons. I have nothing to give you. You must go out into the wide world and try your luck. Begin by learning some craft or another and see how you get on. So the four brothers took their walking sticks in their hands and their little bundles of belongings on their shoulders and after bidding their father goodbye, they all went out to the gate together. After some time, they came to four crossways, each leading to a different country. The eldest brother said, Here we must part, but this day, four years from now, we will come back to the same spot. In the meantime, each of us must try to learn what he can do for himself. So each brother went his way, and as the eldest was walking along the road, he met a man who asked him where he was going and what he wanted. I am going to try my luck in the world and should like to begin by learning some art or trade, answered the brother. Then, said the man, come with me and I will teach you to become the most cunning of thieves that ever was. Ah, oh, no, no, said the brother. That is not an honest calling, and what can one hope to earn by it except to be thrown into prison? Oh, said the man, you need not fear being sent to prison, for I will only teach you to steal what will be fair game. I meddle with nothing that belongs to other people or that will land you in trouble. So the young man agreed to learn this trade. Soon he showed himself to be so clever that nothing could escape him once he had set his mind to have it. The second brother also met a man who asked him what craft he meant to follow. Oh, I do not know yet, answered the young man. Then come with me and be a stargazer. It is a noble art, for nothing can be hidden from you when once you understand the stars. The plan pleased the young man very much. Soon he became such a skillful stargazer that when he had served out his time and wanted to leave his master, the master gave him a special glass, saying, With this you can see all that is passing in the sky and on earth, and nothing can be hidden from you. Now the third brother met a huntsman who invited him to learn his craft. It was not long before this young man became skilled in the craft of the woods, and when it came time for him to take leave of his master, the master gave him a special bow, saying, Whatever you shoot at with this bow, you will be sure to hit. Finally, the youngest brother likewise met a man who asked him what he wished to do. Wouldn't you like to be a tailor? Oh, no, said the young man, sitting cross-legged from morning to night, working backwards and forwards with a needle and thread will never suit me. Oh, answered the man, that is not my sort of tailoring. Come with me and you will learn quite another kind of craft from that. Not knowing what better to do, the youngest brother agreed to learn all that he could about tailoring. And when it came time to leave and set off back into the world, his master gave him a special needle, saying, You can sew anything with this, be it as soft as an egg or as hard as steel, and the joint will be so fine that no seam will ever be seen. Now, after four years had passed, at the time agreed upon, the four brothers met at the four crossroads, and having welcomed each other, they set off towards their father's home, where they told him all that had happened to them and how each had learned some craft. The next day, as they were sitting before the house under a very high tree, the father said, I should like to see what each of you have learned about your craft. So he looked up and said to the second son, At the top of this tree there is a finch's nest. Tell me how many eggs there are in it. 
The stargazer took his glass, looked up and said, Five! Now, said the father to the eldest son, take away the eggs without letting the bird that is sitting upon them and hatching them know anything of what you are doing. So the cunning thief climbed up the tree and brought away to his father the five eggs from under the bird, and it never saw or felt what he was doing, but kept sitting on it at its ease. And then the father took the eggs and put one on each corner of the table and the fifth in the middle. And he said to the huntsman, Cut all the eggs in two pieces at one shot. The huntsman took up his bow and at one shot struck all the five eggs as his father wished. Now comes your turn, said he to the young tailor. Sew the eggs and the young birds in them together again, so neatly that the shot shall have done them no harm. Then the tailor took his needle and sewed the eggs as he was told, and when he had done, the thief was sent to take them back to the nest and put them under the bird without its knowing it. Then she went on sitting and hatched them, and in a few days they crawled out and had only a little red streak across their necks where the tailor had sewn them together. Well done, sons, said the old man. You have made good use of your time and learnt something worth the knowing. Surely you will all find a way now to use your skills for a good purpose in the world. Not long after this, there was a great commotion and uproar in the country, for the king's daughter had been carried off by a mighty dragon, and the king mourned over his loss day and night, and made it known that whoever brought the princess back to him should have her for a wife. Then the four brothers said to each other, Here's a chance for us. Let us try what we can do. And they agreed to see whether they could not set the princess free. I will soon find out where she is, said the stargazer, as he looked through his glass, and he soon cried out, I see her afar off, sitting upon a rock in the sea, and I can spy the dragon close by, guarding her. Then he went to the king, and asked for a ship for himself and his brothers, and they sailed together over the sea, till they came to the right place. And there they found the princess, sitting as the stargazer had said on the rock, and the dragon was lying asleep with his head upon her lap. I dare not shoot at him, said the huntsman, for I might kill the beautiful young princess also. Then I will try my skill, said the thief, and went and stole the princess away from under the dragon so quietly and gently that the beast did not even know it, but went on snoring. Then they hurried off with the princess, jumped into the boat and set sail. But it was not long until they heard the mighty roar of the dragon flying overhead, ready to dive below and scoop up the princess in his scaly claws. But the huntsman immediately picked up his bow, took aim and fired his arrow, piercing the dragon in his shoulder. Down, 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 he plummeted right on top of their boat, causing it to flip over and tossing them all into the waves where they struggled to stay afloat upon a few stray planks from the bottom of the boat. So the tailor took his needle and with a few large stitches put some of the planks together and he sat down upon these and sailed about and gathered up all the pieces of the boat and then tacked them together so quickly that the boat was soon ready and they were able to climb aboard and set off for home once more. The king was 
overjoyed to be reunited with his dear daughter. And he said to the four brothers, One of you shall marry her, but you must settle amongst yourselves who it is to be. Then there arose a quarrel among the brothers, and the stargazer said, If I had not found the princess out, all your skills would have been of no use. Therefore she ought to be mine. Your seeing her would have been no use, said the thief, if I had not taken her away from the dragon. Therefore she ought to be mine. No, she is mine, said the huntsman. For if I had not killed the dragon, he would after all have torn you and the princess into pieces. And if I had not sewn the boat together again, said the tailor, you would all have been drowned. Therefore, she is mine. I'm wondering, which brother do you think should marry the princess? Then the young princess herself spoke up and said, Good sirs, I am grateful to all of you, but I have no mind to marry any of you. You have given me a taste for adventure, and so now I want each of you to teach me your crafts and skills so I can set off into the world to make it a better place. In return, I will have my father give each of you half a kingdom. The four brothers happily agreed to teach the princess all that they had learned. As it turned out, she became so skilled at all four of their crafts, stargazing, honest thieving, hunting and tailoring, that the four brothers were able to spend the rest of their days taking good care of their father and her father the king. Meanwhile... The princess set off into the world using her newly learned skills to make the world a little better and a little brighter for all she met. Now, let's take a journey with the prince with the enormous nose. Long ago, in a far-off land, there once lived a king who made the terrible mistake of making fun of an enchantress because of her rather large nose. So furious was the enchantress that she cast a horrible spell upon the king. There will come a time, she bellowed, when you shall have a son. He shall be born with an enormous nose, and it will remain upon his face until the moment he admits it is a ridiculous nose. The king only laughed and scoffed and went on his merry way, ignoring the enchantress and her horrid spell. After all, he told himself, if my son has a gigantic nose, he will always see it or feel it. And so, of course, by the time he walks and talks, he will realise and admit that he has an unusually large nose. So that will be the end of the problem. It will disappear. Not a matter of any concern. So... Time went by and time went by and finally the Queen gave birth to a dear little boy and they called him Edmund. The prince had big blue eyes, a sweet little mouth and the most enormous anyone had ever seen. It was so big it covered half his face. Sadly, not long after the prince was born, the king, who was rather elderly by now, grew ill and died, leaving the queen all alone to raise the baby prince. 
The Queen was inconsolable when she saw what a large her little son had, but the ladies of the court assured her that it was not really as large as it looked, that it was a Roman and you had only to open any history book to see that every hero has a large Their words comforted the poor Queen, who of course doted on her darling baby boy. And when she peeked again into his cradle, it did seem to her that perhaps his was really not quite so large after all. Now, as the prince grew, everyone around him took great care never to bring attention to his large Instead, they told him all sorts of dreadful stories about people who had short The only visitors who were allowed to come near him had themselves rather large Some of the courtiers, in order to please the queen, even took to pulling their noses several times every day in an effort to make them grow longer. But of course, no matter how they tried, their could never compare to the enormity of the prince's When the prince was old enough to learn about history, his teachers took great care to tell him that all the previous members of the royal family also had very long Every room in the palace was hung with portraits of people who had gigantic. In this way, the prince grew up convinced that a long was a sign of great beauty. On his 20th birthday, the queen declared it was time for him to find a bride and ordered the servants to bring the portraits of several young princesses before him. One of these pictures caught the prince's attention immediately. Her name was Princess Penelope, and she was the daughter of a very wealthy and important king and would one day inherit many riches herself. But the prince did not care a whit about any of that. He saw only a sweetness and a dearness shining forth from her lovely face. And even though she had a rather saucy little <coughs> Prince Edmund was entirely smitten with her. That caused quite a bit of embarrassment for all the courtiers who were now in the habit of laughing at little <coughs> When the prince overheard two of them joking about Princess Penelope's tiny <coughs> he sent them packing. From then on, the other courtiers took great care before they spoke badly about small <coughs> Indeed, one of them went so far as to tell the prince that, though it was quite true that no man could be worth anything unless he had a long <coughs> still, on a woman's face, a smaller <coughs> could be most attractive. The prince gave that courtier a splendid present as a reward for this good news and at once sent ambassadors to ask Princess Penelope's hand in marriage. The king, her father, gave his consent. At once, Prince Edmund set off to meet the princess. He had to travel for many days and many miles, but at last he reached the palace, and when the moment arrived for him to kiss her hand, to the horror of everyone, the enchantress appeared as suddenly as a flash of lightning. Swooping up Princess Penelope, she whisked her away before anyone could stop her. The prince was beside himself with sorrow and despair, but it was not long before he rallied, mustered his wits and his courage, and declared that he would not return to his kingdom until he had found Princess Penelope and rescued her from the evil clutches of this enchantress. Refusing to allow any of his courtiers to follow him, Prince Edmund mounted his horse and rode away. As he journeyed from town to town, he thought all the people he passed must be mad, for all they talked about was the size of his... He couldn't understand why they thought his... was so big, and he assumed they were jealous because they suffered with such terribly small... Thus, time went by, and time went by. Meanwhile, the Enchantress had imprisoned Princess Penelope in a palace of crystal, 
and had hidden this palace in a remote corner of the woods. Still, one day, the prince eventually stumbled upon that remote corner, and there, in the reflection of the crystal walls, he caught the image of his bride, and he whooped with joy. Then he set to work, trying to break into her crystal prison. But try as he might, all his efforts were in vain. Oh, if only I could at least get close enough to speak to my dear heart, he thought. Princess Penelope was of the same mind, and she began to stretch her hand as far as she could through a tiny crack in the crystal walls, hoping that her prince might be able to kiss it. To his sheer delight, Prince Edmund was able to catch hold of her hand. Then he turned first to the right, then to the left, and then back again. But no matter how he twisted or turned, his enormous prevented him from lifting her hand to his lips. For the very first time in his entire life, now Prince Edmund had to face the fact that he had a very long, a ridiculously long, and so he blurted out, Oh, what a nuisance it is to have an that is so enormous that I cannot even kiss my true love's hand. What a ridiculous nose I have. In that same instant, his words sent the crystal palace flying into a thousand splinters. Foolish prince, cried the angry enchantress. It took all these years for you to realize what a ridiculous nose sits on your face. You've been so anxious to believe yourself perfect. You've refused to believe anything at all to the contrary, no matter how many people try to tell you the truth. Not for the moment your nose stood in the way of your own interests did you reckon with it at all. Then she dissolved into a fit of laughter. Humans never cease to amaze me, she gasped in between her cackles. Then, in a gigantic plume of purple smoke, she vanished. Prince Edmund's nose had now returned to a normal size. The size it would have been if not for the enchantress's spell before he was born. With great rejoicing, he and Princess Penelope were married, and from that time on, Prince Edmund listened with only one ear to the flattering remarks of his courtiers, while keeping his other ear open to hear the most honest and most truthful remarks. But most important of all, he and Princess Penelope made sure that no one in their kingdom ever, ever, ever made fun of another person for any reason whatsoever. And so in this way, they both became the most loving, the most wise of rulers that their people had ever known. Let's take a journey with Hands in Luck. Long ago, there once lived a poor young servant lad called Hans. 
who had served his master well and faithfully for seven long years. And at the end of this time, Hans said to his master, Sir, my time is up. I want to go home and see my mother, so give me my wages. Indeed, you have been a loyal and devoted servant, said the master. As the service is, so must the wages be. And he gave him a lump of gold as big as his head. Hans pulled a huge handkerchief out of his pocket and carefully wrapped it around the lump of gold. Then he hoisted it on his shoulder and set off for home. As he trudged along the road, he caught sight of a man riding toward him on a handsome horse. The pair looked so splendid and full of life and joy that Hans cried out, How wonderful it must be to ride a horse like that! So much easier than having to stumble over these stones that ruin one's shoes and wear them to shreds. Well, Hans, why are you on foot at all? Oh, I can't help myself said Hans. I have this great lump to carry. To be sure it is gold, but then I can't hold my head straight for it, and it hurts my shoulder. I'll tell you what, said the horseman. We will change. I will give you my horse, and you shall give me your lump of gold. (gasps) With all my heart, said Hans. But I warn you, you will find it heavy. So the horseman got down off his horse took the gold and, helping Hans up, he thrust the reins into his hands. When you want to go fast, he said, you must click your tongue and cry, gee up. Hans sat up tall and straight upon his horse, delighted with this turn of events, and off he rode with a hoop and a holler of joy. After a while, he thought he should like to go quicker. So he began to click with his tongue and to cry, gee up. At once the horse broke into a fast-paced trot that took Hans off guard and the next minute he found himself thrown off balance and lying there in a ditch by the side of the road. Luckily, a passing peasant who was driving his cow before him caught the horse and guided him back to Hans, who was now struggling to his feet. Well, this riding is certainly not as wonderful as I thought, grumbled Hans, especially on such a feisty horse as this, who throws you before you know where you are and nearly breaks your neck. Never again shall I try this game. But... Your cow is something worth having, I think. After all, one could simply jog along comfortably after her and enjoy her milk, butter and cheese every day into the bargain. What would I not give to have such a cow? Well now, said the peasant, since it will be doing you such a favour... I don't mind exchanging my cow for your horse. Hans happily agreed, and so the peasant swung himself up into the saddle, and off he rode. Hans now went along, driving his cow quietly before him, and thinking all the while of the fine bargain he had made, and how happy he was with this turn of events. With only a piece of bread I shall have everything I can possibly want, for I shall always be able to have butter and cheese to it. And if I am thirsty, I have nothing to do but to milk my cow. And what more is there for heart to wish? After a while he came to an inn, where he stopped for a bite to eat, using up all of the food he had brought with him for both dinner and supper. Then, to wash it all down, he used up his last two coins on half a glass of cider. Feeling full and content, he set off again, driving his cow, until he came to the village where his mother lived. It was now near the middle of the day, and the sun grew hotter and hotter, and Hans found himself on a heath 
which it would be an hour's journey to cross. But he began to feel very hot and so thirsty that his tongue clung to the roof of his mouth. Never mind, said Hans. I can find a remedy. I will milk my cow at once. Tying her to a tree, he took off his leather cap to serve for a pail and he began to milk. But not a drop came. He tried again and again until the beast grew so cross and vexed that she gave him a sharp kick on the head with her hind foot, pushing him to the ground. For a moment Hans felt so dazed and dizzy he did not even know where he was. But luckily along came a butcher who was wheeling a young pig in a wheelbarrow. Here's a fine piece of work, he cried, helping poor Hans on his legs again. Then Hans explained all that had happened to him, and the butcher handed him his pocket flask, saying, Ah, oh, here, take a drink and be a man again. Of course the cow would give you no milk. She is old and only fit to draw burdens or to be slaughtered. Well, to be sure, said Hans, scratching his head. Who would have thought of it? Of course it is a very handy way of getting meat when a man has such a beast of his own to kill. But for my part, I do not care much about cow beef. It is rather tasteless. Now, if I had but a young pig that is much better meat, and then the sausages. Look here, Hans, said the butcher. Just for love of you, I will exchange and give you my pig instead of your cow. <gasps> Heaven reward such kindness, cried Hans, handing over the cow and taking the pig out of his wheelbarrow to lead him away by a string. <coughs> so Hans continued on his way, happy with his last turn of events. After a while, he fell in with another peasant who was carrying a fine white goose under his arm. They bid each other good day, and Hans began to tell him all about his good luck and how he had made so many good exchanges. Then the peasant explained how he was taking the goose to a christening feast. Just feel how heavy it is, said he taking it up by the wings. It has been fattening for the last eight weeks, and when it is roasted, can you imagine how tasty it will be? Ah, yes, indeed, said Hans, weighing it in his hand. Very fine, to be sure, but my pig is not to be despised. Upon which the peasant glanced cautiously on all sides and shook his head. Oh, I am afraid, he said, that there's something not quite right about your pig. In the village where I just came from, there was a pig stolen from the bailiff's yard. Oh, I fear, I fear, you have it now in your hand. And as we speak, they are sending out a search party after the thief. Oh, it would be terrible for you if they found the pig with you. Oh, they would be sure to punish you. Poor Hans grew pale with fright. Oh, for heaven's sake, he begged me. Help me get out of this pickle. I am a stranger in these parts. Take my pig and give me your goose. It will be running some risk for me, answered the man. But I will do it so you come to no harm. So, taking the cord in his hand, the peasant drove the pig quickly along a bypath, and Lucky Hands went on his way home with a goose under his arm. The more I think of it, he said to himself, the better the bargain seems. First, I get the roast goose. Then the fat, that will last a whole year for bread and dripping. And lastly, the beautiful white feathers, which I can stuff my pillow with. 
how comfortably I shall sleep upon it, and how pleased my mother will be. And when he at last reached the village, he saw a knife grinder with his barrel, and his wheel went whirring round as he chanted, My scissors I grind, and my wheel I turn, and all good fellows my trade should learn, for all that I meet with just serves my turn. And Hans stood and looked at him, and at last he spoke to him and said, You seem very well off and merry with your grinding. Ah, yes, answered the knife grinder. My handiwork pays very well. I call a man a good grinder who every time he puts his hand in his pocket finds money there. But where did you buy that fine goose? I did not buy it, but I exchanged it for my pig, said Hans. And the pig? That I exchanged for a cow. And a cow? That I exchanged for a horse. And the horse? And the horse? I gave for the horse a lump of gold as big as my head. And the gold? Oh, that was my wage for seven years' service. You seem to have fended for yourself very well, said the knife grinder. Now, if you could but manage to have money in your pocket every time you put your hand in, your fortune is made. How shall I manage that? said Hans. You must be a knife grinder like me, said the man. All you want is a grindstone. The rest comes of itself. I have one here. To be sure, it is a little damaged. But I don't mind letting you have it in exchange for your goose. What say you? How can you ask? answered Hans. I shall be the luckiest fellow in the world. For if I find money whenever I put my hand in my pocket, there is nothing more left to want. And so... He handed over the goose to the man and received the grindstone in exchange. Now, said the knife grinder, picking up the first stone he saw lying near him, here is another proper and special sort of stone that will stand a good deal of wear. You will be able to hammer out your old nails upon it. Take it with you and carry it carefully. Hans lifted up the stone and carried it off, well contented with his latest turn of events. I must have been born under a lucky star, he cried, while his eyes sparkled for joy. I have only to wish for a thing, and it is mine. After a while, he began to feel rather tired, as indeed he had been on his legs since daybreak. He also began to feel rather hungry, as he had already eaten up all of his dinner and supper earlier that day. At last he could scarcely go on at all, and had to make a halt every moment, for the stones weighed him down most unmercifully and he could not help wishing that he did not feel obliged to drag them along. On he went at a snail's pace until he came to a well. Then he thought he would rest and take a drink of the fresh water. So he placed the stones carefully by his side at the edge of the well. Then he sat down, and as he stooped to drink, he happened to give the stones a little push. And they both fell into the water with a splash. Then, as Hans watched them disappear, he jumped for joy and thanked his stars that he had been so lucky as to get rid of the stones that had weighed upon him so long without any effort of his own. (laughs) 
How happy I am! He cried. Nobody was ever so lucky as I. Then, up he got, feeling light and free from all his troubles, and set off along the road with a spring in his step and a song in his heart. Until at last, he reached his mother's house, where she welcomed him into her open arms, and he began to tell her. Have very easy the road to good luck was. I hope you enjoyed all of our stories for this month. And if you subscribe to our Patreon page, you can enjoy even more perks and resources. Here's to stories aplenty that fill our hearts with grace and goodness, hope and light, so that we remember, as my favourite poet says, All shall be well, all shall be well, and all manner of things shall be well. Be well, my friends, be well, and join me next time for Journey with Story. Music and post-production was by Colette Jonas.